Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it will be posted to our archive page uh, for you to watch later at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do spread the word about our show on Encompass Live uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in um, any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for anyone who might not be from um, Nebraska who's watching, uh, this show or recording. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So we are uh, the state library in Nebraska. So we provide services and resources and training and grants uh, to all types of libraries in the state. So there will be shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, um, really anything and everything. Our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. We have book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show sometimes, talk about services and things we're doing here to the commission, but we bring in guest speakers from across Nebraska and across the country um, even uh, to do presentations. And today we have a Nebraska presenter and a very Nebraska-centric topic show for today. So if you are not a Nebraska library watching this, either live or recording, do be aware, everything we're talking about today is Nebraska focused only. <laughs> Check with your own state for anything different, anything that you might have questions about. Um, but we're gonna talk about the Nebraska Open Meetings Act and Scott Childers, who is the executive director of our Southeast library system is going to guide us through that. Uh, good morning, Scott. Morning. Hey. Um, and we did this a, shop, a show like this about a year ago, actually, um, but things do change. Um, little tweaks sometimes happen to the laws and whatnot in the state, um, and it's always good to have a refresher of these things. So um, we are back again to talk about the um, Nebraska's Open Meetings Act. So I will hand it over to you, Scott, to take it away. Okay. So let me get this going here. There we go. Yep. There we go. All right, so um, first of all, disclaimer, okay. I am not acting as any attendees legal counsel and the information presented today should not be construed as actual legal advice or the promise of such in the future. The goal of today's presentation is to make you aware that such legal requirements exist. If actual legal advice sought for specific reasons, you should contact your city attorney or other such legal professional. So with that out of the way, um, yeah, what is it? So what is this Open Meetings Act? Um, so it's state, state statutes that require public policy be done in a transparent and public manner. Um, the R's are currently located in state statute in these sections. There's a link at the very end of the slideshow that'll take mm -hmm. you directly to the full text of the act. Um, as Krista mentioned, this is a Nebraska uh, state statute. States have their own versions and sometimes they call it something else like Florida's is known as the Sunshine Act and, and other such things, but this is Nebraskans. Um, who has to follow this law? Uh, all, almost all governmental councils, boards, and other groups must comply with the Open Meetings Act, including governing and advisory library boards. Um, so the village board, city council, township board, school boards, also the library boards. I do know there's a couple of libraries that are completely under 501c3. That is rare, um, so, but so they may not have to follow this completely. Um, also, your friends and foundation groups are not going to be under this unless um, there is a quorum's worth of your library board who are also at those meetings. Uh, but we'll get more into quorum a little bit later on. So I will also make a mention that during this presentation, the term public body will be used to cover 
all variations of council boards and other groups that follow this. It's the text in the, the law, and it's a lot faster to be going down all the various boards. We'll just try to say public body. Mm -hmm. I also mentioned push. while we're talking about this that you mentioned that the, the links at the end of the slides. Um, everyone um, the, will get the, uh, the link to the slide presentation um, along with the archive later as well. So um, take notes if you want to, but don't you don't need to try and scribble down everything here and try and get those links later. You'll have the slides um, and the links um, afterwards with the archive. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, yeah, if you have questions, like Krista said, throw them in the questions or chat or whatever section is there open for you. So please feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay. So one of the first things about the Open Meetings Act is you have to let people know that a meeting is being held. Um, you'll see in the heading of the slide, section 84, 1411 is where you find the full text of it. Here's the synopsis. Um, the public is given a reasonable advance notice about the meeting. Here's the kicker. They don't define reasonable, right? That's it, just reasonable. Uh, usually I'm finding 10 days is a good rule of thumb. However, you would want to look at what your own city, village, or whatever is doing to announce their board meetings um, and follow that tradition because uh, that has set the expectation for what the city does. Um, you know, I've seen some where it, it's like a full 14 days, other it's 10 business days, but you, you do want to give advance notice. There was a court case a few years ago where like 10 o'clock p.m. before the meeting date, that is not reasonable, right? No. It has to be in a period of days, not hours for this to apply. Um, there also was a recent change in how you put this out. Uh, in communities of a population of 5,000 or less, this notice consists of putting a notice in the newspaper that covers the community or posting the fiscal notice in three different locations within the community, right? So if you're a smaller town, you have options. Some of our communities don't really have a newspaper that hits frequently enough in the community. I know lots of our small town newspapers have cut down to maybe even once a week. Uh, that's not enough notice. So that's why you have this leeway. If your population larger than 5,000 people, uh, then the notice must be placed in a newspaper that covers the community. This went into effect either last year or the year before, so fairly recently. Um, the locations of where and when the notices were, were placed should be included in the meeting minute. So you have a record of how you advertise the meeting. Okay. More on advertising it. The notice of the meeting shall include time and place of the meeting, agenda of the meeting, or a statement of where people can find the up-to-date agenda. Um, and we'll talk more about what the agenda has to have a little bit later on. This posted agenda can be changed up to 24 hours before the start of the meeting, right? So you can make alterations even after it's posted. Uh, there are some communities where the agenda changes very frequently, so they are using that statement of where you can find the full agenda uh, quite often. Um, all right, so let's talk about the agenda. So what when you have these meetings, uh, a citizen has to be able to, to have a rough idea of what's being talked about so they can decide if they should attend that meeting or give someone some feedback. Uh, an example here is the agenda item being listed as getting books doesn't give much information to someone outside of the library circle what that means. But if you had something like grant proposal to build up financial literacy collection, that would be enough, right? It, it's fairly specific. You're doing something out of the usual norm as far as your business, day-to-day uh, -day business. So it gives enough information. Someone says, okay, that's a topic I might be interested in or have feedback on or whatnot. Another change that kicked in ju just in uh, July of last year, 
uh, cities of the first class and larger shall place on their websites the agenda of the meeting no later than 24 hours before the start of the meeting. And this agenda must continue to be available on the website at least six months. Okay, so that is one of the newest changes um, in Open Meeting Act. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about emergency meeting, but before I get into that, I do wanna mention you can't have special meetings, but they still fall under that no, a reasonable notice and the agenda. Special meeting should be one topic. Um, and I don't have a slide for that, but you could do a special meet special meeting, but it still falls under those same rules as before. An emergency meeting, so this is different. Um, a public body can't hold an emergency meeting without reasonable public no notice. The reason for the meeting has to be stated in the minutes and the only business allowed in this meeting shall pertain to the emergency matter. And it has to be an emergency. It has to be something that is super time sensitive. You don't even have time to call a special meeting on. Like, mm -hmm. hey, the uh, the library had major catastrophic damage and the library board has to be to address a couple of issues with that to approve some sort of cost to, you know, disaster containment or something. Right. Tornadoes, complete, floods, as we've had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the complete minutes of this emergency meeting shall be made available to the public no later than the next regular business day. Okay. So you're not fooling around with emergency meetings trying to hide stuff. It is. We have to decide right away. No time to do uh, all the notice noticing, but we still need to get word out about what we talked about, what we decided the next day. So. Um, I know sometimes I've heard, usually it's the city level, village board or whatever, and they'll have an emergency meeting, but it's really just a special meeting, and they go through the full process, but they call it an emergency meeting because it's out of schedule. Legally, a special meeting and an emergency meeting are two separate things, so just to let you know about that. Um, before I, I move into virtual meetings, were there any questions so far? Uh, see, um, no, uh, nothing has come in yet, uh, but anybody okay. has any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you wanted to know more about, anything you're confused or concerned about um, regarding Open Meetings Act? I know we've had, um, I get questions regularly pretty regularly about things that are Open Meetings Act related. So I uh, definitely type into the question section. Um, just there was, there's a, what someone didn't want to actually wait. Okay, now, of course, as soon as I say things, you know, I wait and chat. <laughs> um, wanted a little more clarification about that, um, keeping the minutes or the agenda for six months that you had mentioned. Mm, that That is on the website. Okay. That's only in communities over 5,000 have to okay. do that. Um, ah. If you're a smaller library and you want to do that, that's great. But that is now state law that the agendas have to be there for at least six months after the meeting. Um, and like I said, that is one year old change. So we, we don't know if there's going to be any refinement or anything on that. Mm. Um, some of the other things that have changed have already been refined through state law. Um, that one's so new, we're yeah. still kind of seeing how this actually works. Right, right. And it is just for the ones over 5,000, which is most of our libraries are not that big, actually. So it probably doesn't doesn't apply to, to most of you. Um, is there any rules about how long they need to keep things um, like in paper, that whole document retention? Or are you going to be getting, you know, that's a whole different topic. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, my rule of thumb is forever. Just okay. pretty basic. It doesn't have to be at the library if there's like a city safe place for documentation. It's always good to have these historical things explaining what happened back in 1947 when something went down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, especially there have been a couple of cases where libraries are dealing with some building things and they wanted to see what that group of, of board members decided way back when 
um, because it's causing maybe some issues now or or trying to find the vendor who provided something so that way they can see if that vendor still exists and they can get the same thing right so, right yeah so yeah uh, i'd suggest minutes readily available versus kind of an archive format where they're tucked away somewhere that's up to you mm -hmm. um if you're talking about so that way anyone could just walk in and get a, a copy uh, of it i'd say no longer than seven years if that mm -hmm. um, but yeah i would hold on to your minutes an agenda packet uh just basically plan on doing that forever in some format yeah and that's something that you could do some sort of a scanning project too if you don't have a paper a place to keep all this paper but you know years ago before electronic start getting things just scanned in and onto a drive somewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, so we do have some questions. Other ones coming in now. Um, the agenda putting it on the library website. Um, does it have to be on the library website or on the is the city's website sufficient? That is a great question. Um, so and that is going to vary by community because I know some libraries have great access to the city website and others have none. Mm -hmm. um, but they have their own. Uh, so I think the, the key part with that is, or there's two things to consider with this. One, how often are you going to change that agenda once it's put up? I mean, can it get put up and stay relatively the same so you don't have to constantly tweak it a bit? Um, and two, what is the norm, right? It's like, if the norm is every other department in the city has their stuff on the city website, the library should probably be there mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, but, you know, like I know, I, there are some cities where it takes a month to get something up on the city website. Mm -hmm. Maybe with this new state law, things will change. And if it's a agenda or something, it will get fast tracked. But so those are things you'll have to consider about in your community. Mm -hmm. um, especially the, you know those with over 5,000 population. Nice. I, I would not suggest using something like a Facebook or social media no. as a count in the spirit of this this particular um, law. So it'd have to be an actual website. So mm -hmm. look at what you have access to, what the norm is for the city, and and kind of make sure it's consistent is the main thing consistently it's put in the same place so so it doesn't say it has to be on the library's website it just says, says it has to be online the law I mean. it has to be online um and, and i think generally people will start just deferring to the city because that's where all the other notices are yeah um, but we're we're so early in that so really you know, it's a guess i've seen many cities where every board of every city department has is listed in the one big thing on the city's website and that's just where they all go and that's yeah that's yeah perfect um great all right um another question about emergency or executive sessions okay um, uh, someone says it is my understanding that an emergency or executive session is held only for disciplinary acquisitions etc is this correct wages for example is not a reason okay it's just like, um, do you mean i, I want to clarify just do you mean the question asker like deciding if some if they're going to give staff a raise or something that is something that should be just be on the regular agenda of a board yeah. meeting and that would not be yeah. an emergency should not be needed for that yeah and, and we're actually talking about two different things i was gonna say emergency and executive are two different set things yes you're right yeah. and i will talk about closed sessions a little bit later on which i think it would be more of the wages and stuff but yes yeah. emergency and and closed sessions are two different things and uh I do know some people kind of throw them together, like I talked about, people throw emergency and special together, but according to, to state law, we have to consider them two different types of, of things. Closed session is part of a reg, another meeting, and we'll get into more uh, in just a little bit on that. But the emergency, it has to be time sensitive, and if wages are time sensitive, someone really messed up. Yeah. <laughs> It should not be um, time for the discussion, no. <laughs> it is literally like we have to have this decided in a matter of days as opposed to waiting a couple of weeks to wait until the next meeting. Yeah. Like yeah. you said, act, you know, 
tornado came through and now what do we need to do or water pipe broke in the library we need to rush and figure out what's what we need to approve funding to bring people into clean etc cetera, etc cetera. so emergent yeah. you know the, 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 the title emergency meeting <laughs> yeah yeah so uh we'll talk about the closed session mm -hmm. some call it an executive session which isn't really a thing but the closed session we'll talk about that a little bit more and yeah. if you have more questions after that feel free to ask them and we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more too yeah okay um that's all we have for now go ahead okay so let's talk about virtual meetings this is also fairly new um back with the pandemic ricketts put an executive order allowing some sort of virtual meetings and then as, as the pandemic wound down legislature put in these rules that way it could continue because people did find it useful to do virtual meetings instead of everyone gathering in some places there you know some where they would all meet wasn't able to hold folks so virtual meetings would allow more people to participate However, there are some guidelines. There are like, a, there's a, a group of boards and such that could do one type of meeting. For library boards, we have to follow these conditions. One, the purpose of the meeting is to discuss items that are scheduled to be discussed or acted on at a vir another non-virtual open meeting. So you can't make decisions as a library board in a virtual meeting. No action is to be taken. You still need to do the, the publicized notice, but that notice has to include a link or dial-in number to access for the meeting. And last but, but not least, there still has to be a physical location where the public can go for those who don't have internet access. That location is listed in the notice and at least one member of the public body is in attendance at that location. Hmm. So you could do virtual meetings, but someone still has to be there at a place. Um, kind of defeats the purpose of virtual meeting mostly, but I think it's a compromise to make sure yeah. there the people is that want or to, need the virtual option have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and the full I did put it in here, but the full meeting has to be available through that webinar. You can't do like okay this group is going to break out do a, another sidebar um, or a breakout room as some web uh meeting things call it uh, the, the mic has to be live at the physical lo location when public comment is happening the people should be able to hear the full board the full public body so um, it's doable but there are some caveats mm -hmm. And can you clarify, someone wants to know what is meant by no action is taken? What is an action that they could not do? Yeah. They can't decide anything. It so is voting on anything. They're, they are purely only allowed for the library board class of things. And it, like I said, it's a very small group of people that can act over virtual meeting right now, like mm -hmm. statewide things that have reps in Chadron and, and you know, Alliance and that there's some up in South Sioux City are getting together is actually becoming a hardship. Those mm -hmm. people can vote online. Local boards can't vote on anything in a virtual meeting. It's only discussion. Okay, so they could have a discussion about something and then at a, the next meeting, they would have to all be physically together somewhere and then yep. do the vote. And, and you still have to do full minutes of virtual meetings so that way you have that information as well and we'll talk more about minutes later too so if the entire board i'm trying to you know i've had people ask about this and i want to make sure we have a clear understanding if the entire board is in the same location physically and but they are also broadcasting it virtual for anyone who wants to listen or participate, can that board then take votes because they are all physically together, even though the meeting is also being broadcast virtually? Yeah, yeah. If the whole board is together, they can vote because basically the transmission is allowing people to see what's going on, but people would still have the availability if they if they had to chose to to get there in front of the public body in full 
in uh, and express opinions and hear the deliberations. Okay. So, um, so yeah, if everyone is there, basically it it's you're transmitting uh, the meeting. I do not think you even have to let public comment in from those seeing the broadcast. So that's what you're doing is broadcasting. Right. So, so it's kind of a different concept. It's not holding the whole meeting virtually, letting people participate. It's just we're broadcasting what we're doing. Yeah. Well, okay. that, that's another good question. And I, I have a feeling, again, this is relatively new as well. I imagine we will see more tweets in this mm -hmm. over the next few years. Yeah, and I think some people have had a lot of questions lately because everyone knew Yes, we can do everything virtually now because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but now that there's been changes to it, there's more confusion. It was kind of obvious, everything virtual, fine, go do it, stay safe. But now that we're trying to make it more, it's more restrictive, um, but still available, people are not sure where the line is for things. Yeah, and, and again, the reason we were able to do it during pandemic was through executive order from the governor's office. Right. and once the emergency kind of ended well so did that you know that executive order so the union camera came up with this the executive order expired so now they changed and put it some per, uh, permanently in the actual open meetings act yeah, yeah. all right cool Thank all you. right all right i will move on here let's talk about the public's rights we we're talking about broadcasting and all that so here uh, the public has the right to attend, record, broadcast, make notes, make comments at a public meeting, right? So anyone in the community could come in and record the full meeting. You could set up a Facebook Live or the local radio station or television station could, could set up cameras. There it is a public meeting in all sense of the word for that. Um, the public body can create rules regarding those rights to allow all attendees to participate. For example, and this is the, one of the big ones, setting time limits on public comments so all who want to make comments have the ability to do so, and the, the meeting doesn't run for 24 hours. So the public body can say, we're gonna have public comment, but you're only limited to three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Uh, I've been at some hearings where they look at the size of the room and say, we have to cut public uh, comment time down to, to like three minutes because there's so many people wanting to talk. So it, that is in that public body's rights. The, the board could say, we've got so many people, we have to limit the time frame. Um, and they can also restrict location of recording devices so they don't impede with other attendees' ability to see, listen, or, or record themselves. Uh, my example is, you can't set up a big television camera like one of the big ones right in front of the chair person's face because that would limit people in the front row who might need to be able to to lip read right they need to be able to see the the chair person's mouth so they can lip read and see what's going on um, there's also things like papers get passed and stuff uh, handouts for the you know, explaining things so you can't set up blockades for that type of thing too um, so they are allowed in the room, but they can restrict some of the locations so that way it doesn't impede other people in that room or stop business from actually happening because they're dodging microphones and things like that. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the cans and cannot. The public body cannot, so these are these things are prohibited from the, the public body making rules on. They, cannot require the public to identify themselves to simply attend the meeting. Anyone can walk in that door to the meeting. Okay. They cannot require the individual to be on the agenda prior to the meeting to make comment on something on the agenda. So let's say there's something on the agenda. They cannot say all those who want to make a for or, or, or against comment have to go to City Hall and sign a paper. They cannot require that. People should be able to go into that meeting and make comments. Now, the public body can say we are doing public comment all at once for all the things on the agenda, or they can break it down per agenda item. That is their right, but they cannot require pre registration to do so. Okay. 
what they can do, they can require someone making public comment to disclose name and address, um, unless there's something severe like a witness protection type of thing, right? To protect the com commenter. But they can say, if you're gonna talk to us, we have to know who you are and what address you're at. Uh, because it's a public comment, not an anonymous comment. You do not have the right to be to give anonymous content uh, feedback to your public body in these meetings. And they can have some meetings without time for public comment at all. Notice uh, it is some, not all. Some things that it's like, we have a full agenda. None of this is being voted on today. So we'll do public comment on these agenda items at our next meeting. Next time. Those type of things. Um, if they do not allow public comment for long stretches of time, then they could be, find, uh, could be found in violation of this, this law. But you certainly could say this meeting, we just, we're not actually voting on anything that we haven't already discussed and we'll or the stuff we'll discuss at our next meeting as well. So we're gonna withhold public comment time for this meeting because we had it last meeting on these things and next meeting on these other things. Right. Does that make sense to, to folks? I Looks like it. Nobody's got any questions about it. <laughs> All right. Um, so continuing with the public's rights. A current copy of the Open Meeting Act must be posted in the same room as the meeting being held. That location is pointed out at the start of the meeting. Um, there is a fairly recent court case clarifying posting a copy. It means attaching it to a bulletin board, hanging it on a chain, or fastening it to a wall somehow. A loose copy on the table in the room will not satisfy this law's requirement. Um, Again, this is a fairly recent court case. I know back when I started, that was actually still some advice like well you don't have to post it just put some copies that there on the the table um, the reason is that way people can review the public meeting law without getting in the way of business and without creating a hardship for other folks in the room so that's why it's it has to be kind of posted um, and then krista do we know much about posters for this year or um that's still being worked on. Question. Yes. Um, yeah. If pe um, some people may have in your um, libraries, in your meeting room somewhere, um, posters, big, you know, wall size posters, not just little eight by, eight by 11 things um, that were provided by the League of, League of Nebraska Municipalities in the past. And um, I have reached out to them to get updated ones. Yes. Uh, and uh, we, are waiting until after this we were waiting until after this legislation legislative session ended which it just did so i do have to get in touch with them to and they are going to po um produce new ones with all of this year's changes um i tried to get them last year and we kind of got lost on shuffle but then they made more changes so that was okay <laughs> um and so they are going to be producing a new poster and here at the library commission we are going to be purchasing acquiring however it's going to go um copies for every public library in the state so we will get a poster for each one of you to have and we will mail them out to you at some point don't know when yet i've got to reach out to find out how long it takes to print out new ones um and where they are in that process uh, but as soon as we do we will be ordering um 300 some odd posters and sending them out to every library so everyone will have a new current version of the poster to post <laughs> put up in whatever is your reading meeting room if it's a meeting room in the library sure if it's a meeting room that's at the city offices i mean you can put it wherever it works uh, best for you but it, we are sending it to all the public libraries um, coming soon as soon as i find out where they are in the process <laughs> but i had to reach out to them already saying can we do this and they said yep no problem we'll do it after the session's over and when we print out new ones so excellent um, in the meantime, I mean, you could print out some copies and stick them to the wall with scotch tape. It, it, I know some of our walls don't react well to scotch tape, but you could do something temporarily until those posters come in. So, okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go into minutes. If you have questions, go ahead and start putting them in the chat. Um, so, 
the minutes are an important part of this because not only are the minute are the meetings transparent, people have to be able to go in and see, you know, have that record of what was discussed. So minutes shall include the time and place of the meeting, members present and absent, and substance of all matters discussed, right? Uh, what that means is you have to have a good idea of the, what the discussion entailed, uh, what points were made up, what discussion points were made up. You can't just say, uh, especially for things that the board votes on, uh, like you can't just say the librarian talked about summer reading uh, and the board voted yes. Can't do that. You need a little bit more meat on that. A little bit more uh, information. Uh, speaking of votes, any vote will be done by a roll call vote with each member's vote recorded in the minutes. Uh, this can be waived when you're voting for officers for the group. But yeah, people need to know how their representatives voted. So that is something that a lot of our libraries don't do, but it is in state statute. Um, Minutes and all documentation received or disclosed will be available for public within 10 working days of the meeting. Communities under 5,000 can get another 10 days if the person in charge of, of minutes falls ill because they realize sometimes that there's one person who ha who's handling all this. Um, but if you're over 5,000, that is a hard line 10 days mm -hmm. after the meeting. Um, I also want to point out all documentation. Uh, what I'm seeing uh, for most of the interpretation of this is if you're passing the board a handout with something, a copy of that handout also needs to be attached with the minutes. Um, there are some city attorneys who say no, but it, I find in those cases, the minutes are just basically pasting and copying that information into the minutes. So all of that has to be available to someone researching what happened in that meeting. So you, you make a flyer about something, attach it to the minutes in, in the file. Um, another new thing, cities of the first class and larger shall place on their websites the minutes of the meeting no later than 10 working days after the meeting. And those also have to remain on the website for at least six months. Okay, so if you're one of the larger communities, not only are you putting your agenda on the website, you are now putting the minutes on the website per state law. I would follow the same guidelines that you're using for the agenda as far as which website you put it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one just kicked in. Was it just July last year? Too? It That was also very new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the last year thing as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, before we get closed sessions, were there questions about minutes coming in? Check my time while we're doing that. Anybody have minutes questions? Type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I don't see anything right now, but if you think of anything, go ahead and type. Um, We've got plenty of time in the session today, so we will we can jump back to anything if you think of it later, definitely. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about closed sessions. We touched on it earlier. Um, closed sessions, I've seen some refer to them as executive sessions. I, I don't know what's executive about them because uh, it's still the same people. Um, state law calls them closed sessions. These uh, These are part of the open meeting, right? They aren't as... Uh, they can be special, but there still has to be a public meeting surrounding it. These meetings can have these closed parts of a meeting when it's talking about things like strategy sessions with collective bargaining, real estate purchases, litigation that's either pending or imminent, right? Because that type of stuff, if that is done in an open forum, you're actually making it harder for the city to get things done as far as good prices on, on real estate. Uh, if it's collective bargaining, then that could, could hurt either side of the argument. Litigation, you don't want to have a lot of those strategy sessions in public because then you might not be able to do use some of that information in the actual litigation itself. So all those seem fairly uh, 
fairly reasonable. Uh, discussion regarding deployment of security personnel or devices. If you're having security, you don't want full information out because whatever you're trying to protect against will know where to avoid and find other routes into a building or, or whatnot. Um, investigative proceedings regarding allegations of criminal misconduct. Conduct. This is one of those where you are actually helping protect the individual who's being investigated because if it's public meeting, people will have these things away. And remember, people are innocent until proven guilty. So some of the investigative proceedings are best done behind closed doors until you have the facts known. And then evaluation of the job performance of a person when necessary to prevent needless injury to the reputation of, of that person. And if that person is not requested a public meeting. Okay. It's talking about an employee, it could be potentially embarrassing to them, um, depending on what the case is. So those can be in closed session. The employee can also say, I want this to be part of the open meeting. It, it's in there in state law. I've had someone tell me that they were told it's only for union employees or unionized employees, and that's not the case. It is in state law that. The, oh, wow. I had not yeah, heard that before. <laughs> uh, again, the 84, 1410, so that's chapter 84, section 1410. If you want to look at it for yourself, um, you don't have to take my word for this or any of it. Um, you can look it up for yourself. But yes, so, so sometimes it is in the employee's best interest to make it a public meeting, especially if they feel like the people evaluating them in, in a potential closed session will be biased. Right. So that employee can have that protection. Um, it's not on here, but I will mention a closed session cannot be held to protect the reputation of the board members holding that meeting. Right. I've seen some boards want to do that, but that is prohibited. You can protect other people in the community, but the board itself, their reputation cannot be protected through a closed session. Hmm. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, like I said, I, I've heard of things happening. I, I wasn't there, so I can't report any violations because I wasn't there. But that is something good for you to know. Um, as, and I would not be surprised if there's possibly a library board member, someone eventually, who wants to have a close mission, close I should protect their reputation. That could not happen. So the board people, do not get that protection of a reputation protection by closed session. So is that kind of the concept of they're a public figure or in public office sort of member right. of a body. Yeah. Right. All of their decisions should be able to be scrutinized eventually. Um, and I have a little bit more about oh, uh, some types of public bodies have other eligible reasons, but those don't apply to to library boards or city councils and stuff like that. So um, a little bit more in closed session. The process goes, you are in an open meeting, right? The board states the reason for a closed session, and then there is a public vote to go into that closed session while in that public part of the meeting. They cannot start a meeting and have it be completely closed at all. That, so that's one thing. There is a public meeting. They give the reason why they, they want to go to closed session, and then there is a public vote to go into that. It is possible that the board members decide to vote against going into closed session. It's completely possible. So that happens. They go into that closed session. Either they excuse all the people in the meeting to say, please go out in the hall, or the board members themselves go to an isolated room. They have their discussion. They come back start the open meeting up again and then they can vote they cannot vote in that closed session the vote has to be public that roll call vote that we talked about has to happen in public right so uh, th there is some process here so they cannot hold a, a completely secret meeting at all that doesn't allow anyone in there has to be a time where people are notified, people are allowed in the room, 
they say whether to go to the closed session, they vote to go into that closed session. And then when they come out, they vote on whatever it is they need to vote on. Yeah. This is Open Meeting Act, even those private discussions, if there is a vote to be taken, it has to happen in public. So, questions on that? Mm. I think I scared everyone away. <laughs> uh, okay, oh, question did come up. Oh, okay, good question. Do all board members have to vote to approve a closed session? Um, the vote for closed session follows the quorum rules for that that board. It does not have to be unanimous. Right? So if a quorum says we're going into closed session, mm -hmm. it's going into closed session. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll move on, but please feel free to throw questions in and we can always come back. I do want to touch on something, social events. I know in many of our small communities, you can't help but run into other board members at things, right? School activities, church activities, uh, social groups like Lions, Rotary, um, all of those. There is a statement in Open Meeting Act that allows more than a quorum of members to get together at functions. And I'm going to quote it here, uh, and the, the citation is at the end. The act does not apply to chance meetings or to attendance at or travel to conventions or workshops of members of a public body in which there is no meeting of the body than intentionally convened. If there is no vote or other action taken regarding any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. Okay. So all the board members go to a training meeting. Fine. No problem. It, that doesn't have to be open meeting act as long as they're not voting on anything that that board has control over. Um, another example, let's say the library is having a fundraiser or a book sale. All the members of the board can be there. They just have to be really careful not to talk about business or vote and try to decide stuff at that session. Um, if you've got people who can't help but talk about that while they're around, you may want to suggest, okay, you two are over that corner, you two are over that part of the room. Uh, and that's kind of an extreme thing, but as long as it's, it's not a meeting, they're not doing meeting type things, it's okay. They could all sit at the same bleacher at the, you know, at the school graduation if they wanted to. It's all right. But yeah, I, that was another concern because I know it's like, there are some times where it's like the extended family gets together and you've got a quorum of board members. Uh, it's okay, as long as you're not talking to or voting on or deciding things that you right. want. Right, they understand right. that these kind of social things happen. That's They're not preventing you from being social, <laughs> but just pay attention to what you discuss when you are. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's talk about consequences for violating this act. Okay. First of all, if you think there's a violation, who do you contact? Uh, the county attorney and the state attorney general are the people who enforce this, right? So if you think something happened, you go to the county attorney first, and then the attorney general. Uh, any meeting that is held to have been found to have violated this act could see any and all decisions made in that meeting voided. So that means if, if there was a decision in a meeting that violated this act, you could do a, another lawsuit to void those specific things. It, it makes it vulnerable to change. Um, also for the individuals involved, um, there's a quote here, I won't read it out loud, but to be guilty of a class four misdemeanor, which is a $500 fine, and then for multiple offenses, there's a class three misdemeanor for a second, which is a $500 fine or three months in jail. Um, and then severe violations of o Open Meeting Act, like repetitively violating acts over and over with no, with no regard 
to, to how it's supposed to be done. There could be more uh, severe penalties. Well, then we're all then we're going into like fraud level of of discussions if it's continuously and repetitive violations of acts. So, um, so yeah, there is an individual penalty for violating the, these laws. Um, uh, uh, I also want to mention that um, anyone who was at that meeting can report these. It doesn't have to be someone of similar stature as the board members. So any attendee of a board board meeting or a public body meeting that violates these could report it to the county attorney. Um, in fact, there are sections where if you don't, then you might be held liable as well, uh, especially board members. Um, there is a statute of limitations on reporting it like a year, if you wait a year, that means uh, nothing will probably happen. So things to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, that's, th this is not a toothless piece of legislation. There could be harm to the community and to the individuals if you violate this. So okay. in order to bring this to, um... The attorney general or the county attorney, someone would have to. Uh, it, it's a lawsuit that would have to happen, or, or can you just call them and say, "Hey, I think something they did something wrong. Can someone check on it?" I mean, how do they actually? Uh, it, it, it depends if you're looking for um, if you yourself was harmed because of it. Then there might be a lawsuit involved, but you could just report it to county attorney or if you think you witnessed general. that they were doing something that it was against the Open Meetings Act. Right. But if you yourself are looking to get some sort of, you know, uh, I, the word escapes me, even though I was looking at it earlier, uh, you were personally harmed because of a decision held in a meeting that was not held under Open Meeting Act. You could file your own lawsuit and your attorney fees could also be returned back to you if found that, yeah, you were harmed and they have to pay up mm. or they have to change mm. their decision or whatnot. Um, but yeah, if it's just like, hey, they're not doing the right thing, I wasn't personally harmed, but they need to follow the law, then you can but just- I know that they, this is what the Open Meetings Act says and they're not doing it, yeah. yeah. Um, they may what ask about for other library laws. Is that the same situation for? I know we, we did a separate session, and I should have mentioned that too. Um, we have kind of a two sessions we've done here on Encompass Live that kind of go together. Um, last month on June 21st, we did a session on Nebraska library laws, um, and we mentioned briefly Open Meetings Act during that session, but then we needed really a full meeting just on that. Um, so would that be the same situation if we, you think that any library is breaking um, library or city is not following um, library laws? Oh, like all the other okay. library laws? <laughs> it, that part of state statute is unclear about the path that could be taken. I would probably start with county attorney. Um, and start they may say, yeah. we can't do anything unless there is an actual lawsuit of some form. Um, uh, but yeah, like Open Meeting Act, it's pretty clear what the pathways are if something happens. Uh, Chapter 51, it's not really spelled out there. Mm -hmm. So that would, it's a little bit more of a gray area who you would start with. I might start with the county attorney. Um, I know in some communities, the county attorney is the same as the city attorney. So then you would probably have to go up to state level. Um, because if the county attorney is also the city attorney, they will be defending the city attorney. It's part of their job. So you can't have them pursue something um, that way and for chapter 51. So yeah, that one's a little less clear for mm -hmm. that. Part. For Open Meeting Act, it's fairly clear your pathways to report it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to have this slide links for reference. So text mm -hmm. of, of Open Meeting Act, what that link goes, it goes to the website with the first part of it. If you want the full text, that second link, link gives you all of it. 
in, in one big go. So you can copy, paste, print out, what have you. Uh, Attorney General's notes on Open Meeting Act is also very useful to find information on how things would be interpreted by, by his office. Right. Um, I, I do also want to mention there were four bills in this last unicameral on Open Meeting Act. None of them passed, but um, Open Meeting Act does change. We went at least three straight years with some tweak that would affect library boards. Mm -hmm. uh, advertising, where you hold up meeting, uh, involved with the newspapers. One year saw something that was passed the previous year got tweaked. Um, so it is good to kind of keep track of this. That's kind of why Chris and I are doing this review this year. We right might be doing yeah. something year after year. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of those bills that was introduced, it did not pass, would have changed meetings because then you had to allow public comment at every meeting and it may not have been as restricted, time restricted as before. That's something that we have to keep in mind. If we're holding a board meeting, we could be here for three hours. Hopefully it never happens, but um, then there were some other smaller things that wouldn't affect library boards. But so that's, it would be good to, after the session ends, maybe do a little bit of saying what passed, what does it, when does it take effect? Mm -hmm. That type of thing. Any other questions? All right. Um, yeah, and those links, um, as, as I said, they're in the slides that you're going to receive, um, you'll, you'll have access to um, after the session. And I've also linked them from the um, event page for this show too, so you have quick access there as well. Um, but you can keep your slide up there for now, Scott. Um, does anybody have any, we have, a, we have still a few minutes left that we can um, answer um, any questions you have. So please do type your questions in if you have anything you want to ask about now. Um, that you thought of. If you think of something later, go ahead and reach out to Scott at the Southeast Library Commission system, <laughs> Southeast Library system, and um, or myself, and we can answer your questions. Um, so I think we answered the question about the emergency executive session and what it's what they are for and not for. Um, we have a new question here. Um, was June closed for meeting? Okay, so it's kind of a, a mixture of things. So they want to know if these particular things are they want to be confirmed if these particular things are a violation violation of the Open Meetings Act. Proxy votes, voting without a quorum, and votes during a closed meeting. Are all three of those in violation of the Open Meetings Act? Okay. Um, proxy votes aren't addressed at all in, in the Open Meeting Act, so I would assume that those are not allowed. There's no provision for that happening. Right. Those last two definitely are. You need the quorum to be able to conduct business. So if you have a five-person board, you need at least three. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot conduct business with just two. Um, and then the votes in closed session, again, that is in violation. You cannot do votes in closed session. Nope. You the, can have a discussion in closed the meeting, but then you come out and just do the vote. Right. So both of those would be in violation. Yep. Um, I, I, don't, I also want to mention here, I don't think we got into quorum. Um, that does pay a, a distinction because there are some times where there needs to be some board interaction, but not a full meeting. You could do that. You could have two members of your library board as kind of a committee. They can't decide anything, but they can do research. They can talk with an architect. They can talk with the librarian. That is fine because you can't, with two people out of a five-person board, right? That's not quorum. They can't vote on anything then they can take that information and bring it to the full board later, right? So that is okay. Um, there are some libraries where if they're hiring someone, they have two members of the library board as well as the librarian kind of doing all of the, the interviews and such. And then, you know, just that way there's multiple people there, they get multiple points of view on, uh, on a candidate, but they aren't deciding right then and there, there's whatever process they're doing later. Um, so that is also something useful for you. You could have board reputation on things without needing the full board, as long as you're not deciding anything right there and then. The vote goes in front of the full board. So. Right. All right. All right. Thank you. 
Um, any other, I didn't see anything else come in while we were answering that question. Any other last minute desperate questions you want to ask about Open Meetings Act? Um, go ahead and get it typed into your question section. Um, I'll keep an eye on that, but I'm gonna pull presenter control back to my screen just to do work on my little wrap up here while we're um, waiting to see if there are any other questions. All right, there we go. Um, we just got some thank yous. Thank you, Scott, for uh, all this info. Good resources. We hope so. <laughs> um, as I said, this is a question we get asked a lot about um, open meetings and the library laws, the previous session that we did. Um, and that's why we did these, these sessions. And you know, we have our legislature do things every year. And um, this may become a regular thing if something changes in either Open Meetings Act or in state library laws or anything we think affects libraries, we will do updates um, after each session is, is ended. So um, we'll see if we'll do another one next year. Depends on how it goes. <laughs> um, and some of these changes are good and we like them and some of them are like, mm, all right. Uh, like the, um, I'm glad the one you mentioned about um, every meeting you have to allow public comment. That's just not feasible, I don't think. Yeah, and I'm glad. It, just the logic isn't there. So, uh, all right. So um, for today's show, um, as I said, this is the event page for today's show. And you might've seen it wasn't there before, but I added it while we were talking, a link to the text of the Open Meetings Act and to the Attorney General's notes. So I, I added these two here. So this is the, act, the actual from the state legislature website. And then from the Attorney General's page, I use this myself a lot to just confirm what, because there's more in here, not just the law, which sometimes reading the law is very dry and like, well, what does that mean? He talks about, well, this is how it works in practice. And this is what I would say if <laughs> someone came to me about this issue. Um, oh, another question just popped up. I'll grab that while I'm seeing it here. Um, oh, another question. Uh, how long do we have to retain audio recordings of the public meeting? So you mean when we do a virtual session, if there was a meeting, is there how, what are the rules, if any, on retaining the audio recording or the you know virtual recording like this? There is nothing in state statute regarding audio recordings or video recordings of meetings uh, retention wise. So that is up to how you want to archive it and research it. Um, the only requirements would be um, for the written material and that type of thing so the minutes are the official record of what happened at the meeting yeah yeah so whatever recordings that will be basically up to you and your city or or township or county or whatever level it, it, the meeting is held at as far as how you retain it and, and that type of thing um, i can imagine that might be something in a few years we'll see them look at address um, that it, yeah it, also doesn't an individual's records uh, that is also not part of state statute so people in the room they do not have to give up their recording they do not have to hand in their notes the public for that there, individual right. so that that brought up another question i heard from another group is like can they make me hand in my notes it's like no this isn't school those <laughs> notes are for you uh, unless you are the secretary then you have a whole other duty uh, in, right. involved, but, but yeah, individual broadcast recordings are not property of the city. They are property of the person who took those recordings or notes or whatever. Right. Um, so notes, so then here notes though of people who attended the meeting, what about the notes of the actual board members if they take their own notes? That Those are not covered with this. It is assumed that the minutes would be the official record um and yet there was a group that the people taking the board members had to hand in their notes for some reason i think that's kind of odd mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it, there's nothing in state law about keeping it, an individual person's notes it is the minutes so right. that document that's created that is the the, the thing Official that is recorded. record of what happened yeah yep Okay. Um, the only time those notes might get called into is if there is some lawsuit or something. Um, but that, that is that individual would get subpoenaed, not the city. Mm -hmm. In my right, what I've understood, I could be wrong. That's one of those 
I'm not the lawyer. Talk to an actual lawyer. Right. Yeah. If that's those things start happening, that's when you call a lawyer, not me or Scott. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's gotten that far, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, as I said, this is the session page for today's show. It's going to be on our um, archive page. So I'm going to pop back to the um, Encompass Live main page. Um, if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of our show, you will come up with our main page and our archive page in your search results. These are our upcoming shows, um, but our archive shows are right here afterwards, most recent ones at the top of the page. Today's will be posted here by the end of the day tomorrow. And we'll have a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to um, Scott's slides. Uh, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready. Uh, we will also post them to our um, so various social media. We have a Facebook page. Oh, actually, that's over here. Yeah, that we link to. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We post about, here's a reminder to log in today's show, uh, meet our presenters, and then um, when recordings are available, we post on here. Um, we use the little hashtag Encump Live as an um, abbreviated hashtag of our show name on here and on Twitter and on Instagram, the Library Commission uses. So you can keep an eye on things we're doing over there as well. Uh, you can search these archives if you want to uh, on it for any topic. You might want to see if we did on a, show, um, a show on a topic. As we mentioned, we did um, Open Meetings Act last year, but I would watch this year's show because it's updated. <laughs> uh, but this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. So we we're going on 15 years of the show. <gasps> oh my God. Uh, but we do have them all here. And you know, this is something that we will do. We're librarians, we keep things for historical purposes. And as long as we have some place to host our videos, our recordings, which right now is our YouTube channel, we will have them up here. Um, so just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything. They're all dated, so you can find it when the show first happened. Um, and do be aware, things will change. Some shows will stand the test of time and still be great, useful information, but some things may be old, outdated, resources may have changed drastically or no longer exist anymore. Uh, links may be broken. Uh, people might not work at the same library they worked at when they brought, when they you know uh, presented for us ten years ago. So just pay attention to that date if you do watch any of our older shows. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Scott, for doing this update again for us. Maybe we'll see you again next year, <laughs> depending on how. Uh -oh. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's our upcoming shows. I mean, as you can see, I'm getting August dates filled in. But next week, it is the last Wednesday of the month. So that means it is pretty sweet tech day. Uh, last Wednesday of the month is always when Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on the show and does a show about something tech related. And what we're doing next week is we have a guest presenter, our newest staff member here at the commission, I think, um, Andrew Sherm. Sherman is our new on our computer services team, and he's going to talk about filtering um, for SIPA compliance and just security in general, um, cybersecurity issues that you will want to um, be paying attention to um, for computers that you have in your library. So if you are have ish concerns about that or questions or wonder how do I filter, what's it all about, Sherm um, will be talking to us about that next week. So please do sign up for that show and any of our other upcoming ones. Keep it on our schedule. I'm in conversations with people. We'll get some more sessions added into there for August and September. All right. Other than that, thank you, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.